Before we get to the last panel, we did, um, Bill and I neglected to include one uh, tribute that was sent um, by his dear friend, Peter Field. He was not able to join us for, I think, some obvious reasons, um, but uh, wanted to include uh, what he sent here. Uh, this again is from Peter. Ted at first refused. It was 2011 and we'd been friends and colleagues for two decades. He refused to consider applying to the James Madison program. He had his reasons that elude me now. Something about Ivy League and Aquinas and political science being oxymoronic. Nothing could be more in character than Ted McAllister offering a rigorous, ethical, deeply considered critique of why something was not right. If it were right, if it were not right, no fellowship, no stipend, no honorarium would get Ted to step onto the Princeton campus. For my part, I never met a man more devoted to truth-seeking in such a self-conscious way. Ted was tough, tough on me, on all his friends and colleagues. He was brutally tough on himself. Never saw, never say or be or do or apply for a fellowship. That is not completely and utterly isomorphic with your core being. That was and is Ted. Anyone who wrote or co-wrote articles or books with Ted could not help but love him. As much as any friend, he demanded our best work and would not settle and would settle for nothing less. Yes, one could not but love him and hate him too. A kind of love-hate thing. Ted struggled to generalize because for Ted, generalization was somehow a form of mendacity. He was equally obsessed with precision. If something Ted wrote could be misinterpreted and therefore be read falsely, Ted blamed himself. The only remedy was to write with the kind of precision that foreclosed ambiguity. He was obsessively honest in his words. I ask you tonight to imagine writing a 1,500-page survey textbook on American history without generalization or ambiguity. That's the colleague and friend I found maddening, difficult, exhausting, and whom I unconditionally adored. Ted ultimately relented and went to Princeton. Here's what I wrote on his behalf 15 years ago, quoting himself. I should like to add a personal note. Ted is a uniquely bright, reflective, and generous man. Without question, awarding him a fellowship will benefit everyone else involved with the James Madison program. An astute and demanding critic, as well as an exceedingly generous, as well as exceedingly generous with his time, he will materially add to the intellectual atmosphere of the program in a way that no other scholar can. My own work has benefited immeasurably from his readings. I cannot think of anyone more deserving from Peter Field. So uh, we begin our last panel uh, titled Coming Home. Um, this is going to be more personal in nature. Um, and so to lead that, his uh, dear friend and colleague and many excellent adventures, Bill McClay. And, uh... It is, a, it is so wonderful to be here. Um, this will be partly personal and, and partly not so personal, although in a way it's all personal. Um, first of all, I want to thank Mark uh, Kaltoff for uh, the uh, long, beautiful quotation that he read, so rich, uh, where Ted is riffing on the, the concept of the remembered past. And this, uh, I, I wanted... To, to uh, in fact, when I sent the the sort of list of uh, uh, people for the conference, I used the title "The Remembered Future," uh, which I thought was very clever uh, because Ted did write about the remembered past, and John Lukacs writes about the remembered past, and and I thought, well, this carries the idea that to recover Ted's teaching and keeping it going is a way of thinking about the future and uh, um, and the, the role of memory in uh, in. Uh, in civilized life, uh, and uh, 
and that what we were doing here, as Steve Wren has said, was, is, is an act of homage that's also an act of mourning. Uh, and in the spirit of Edmund Burke saying that people, I always get this quote wrong, so I have to look at the people, people will not look forward to posterity who never look backward to their ancestors. Uh, in, it's in the reflections of the revolution of France. Uh, and the, the sense that history is a tremendous reservoir of, uh, of energy and hope and inspiration. I, I, th I think of, I, I've been watching lately uh, something I recommend to all of you. I'm not sure Steve Hayward knows it backwards and forwards. The uh, television series, uh, The Wilderness Years, in which Robert Hardy plays Winston Churchill. And it deals with that period when, in which Churchill is forced out of power and there, there is this uh, uh, just invincible blindness to the rising Nazi threat from his own party, Stanley Baldwin et al. And, uh, and there's a moment in, in that drama when Churchill goes out to Blenheim Palace, you know, the, the um, place of his ancestors, and he stands before the... The, the column of, it's, it's a column of victory, I think it's called. Uh, they, they never did build the obelisk there, but there's a column of victory and that memorializes the Duke of Marlborough, his, his ancestor, about who he was also writing. Uh, and there's this sense, that Churchill's really down on his fortunes. I don't remember the exact uh, um, uh, cause where there was a political, it was some political defeat and uh, humiliation by Stanley Baldwin or someone else. And uh, um, the whole series, I think, echoes profoundly the time of foreboding then, the time of foreboding now. Uh, and I, I won't dwell on that except to recommend it to you as, a, as something for to help you think about uh, reaching back to the past in the way that Churchill did in that moment when he stood before the column of victory and remembered uh, a, better, a better past and drew on the, that for his energy to move forward, even as people were telling him his career was over. There's a point, uh, I won't go on about it, there's a point in the scene where he's interviewed by a couple of kids, journalists, and he, they say, what are you going to do now that your career is over? <laughs> Uh, uh, very, very poignant. But so uh, uh, the the remembered future, I thought, was a very clever title. But instead, we got a better title. I think a more appropriate title, "Coming Home," because I think you all would have been mystified by what is the remembered future. So, "Coming Home," and of course, it's the title of this book. Which, if you don't own it, you must. Yeah, um, you must acquire it too. Um, and the theme of coming home is itself a powerful theme. It's the great theme. It's the great theme of the of the Christian faith, of the of Judeo Christian faith, of the the, the story of the of exile and return, uh, of uh, the the prodigal son. Uh, that to come home, you have to have gone away from home. Uh, so uh, it, it, we've, we have in some way gone away. That's the implication of the title and borne out by the text. And yet there's something hopeful in this. Uh, Ted was a big fan, as I am, of this, these lines from T.S. Eliot, uh, familiar probably to many of you, from uh, one of the four quartets called Little Gidding. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So there is some, something to be said for leaving home in order to come back to home, that, that a recognition that, that one's better able to attain to, a kind of pilgrimage, if you will. Um, it's not a big, gigantic mistake, although it may well be. Um, I, I was going to to shamelessly steal some of this time to do my own testimonial uh, to, uh, to Ted, uh, which I think has some interest and it flows into my examination of ideas, um, how I met him. I actually don't, it, it's a little hazy when I first met him, but um, he, he was fresh out of graduate school. I may even have met him when he was still in graduate school at Vanderbilt. 
uh, and I wasn't too far removed from graduate school myself. Um, but he, uh, but I, I was, just, I think by that time I had tenure, and so I was compared to him, an established figure. And uh, he approached me uh, and said he was uh, organizing a book series, and he wanted me to write a book on the, the, the problem of public memory. And how he knew that this was something I was actually interested in, in fact, very interested in, have remained very interested in, I don't know. Uh, he'd read some of my things, I, you know, but I didn't know there was anything that gave any indication of that. But he, he knew how to read between the lines. And, uh, and he was so brimming with self-confidence. This just out of graduate school guy who was teaching at Tennessee Tech uh, University. There is such a place, yeah, I, I want you to know, in uh, Cookville, Tennessee. Um, and uh, uh, he... Uh, uh, but he was acting as if he was already a sort of mover and shaker. And he was so persuasive, and I loved the idea so much, he talked me into it. Then I found out, well, the series was really just a, <laughs> uh, uh, an idea. Uh, he didn't actually have a publisher. Uh, and, uh, and things dragged on for a while, and, and uh, I kept asking, well, how's things come out of that publisher? From? Well, yeah, yeah, we're working on it, working on it. And, um, and he had actually contacted a couple of different publishers, one of which was Roman and Littlefield. Uh, I think the other major contender was the University Press of Kansas, which had published uh, the Revolt Against Modernity book. And, uh, and at that time had a really wonderful editorial director that we all loved. Um, it, anyway, uh, so I, after a while, I kind of, I don't know what made me do this, but I said to him, well, you know, if you want me to come aboard as your co-editor, and you think that would help get, get this proposal taken seriously, I'll do that. Uh, and then we got Jean Bethke Elstein, which was, uh, she never did anything with the series, frankly speaking, but, but lending her name to, so to, so to speak, the masthead was, was invaluable. So we, we, we got, uh, and we actually ha en ended up in a competitive situation. And, uh, Chose Roman and Littlefield because they had uh, they had made a better offer. They were just starting to publish history books, and little did we know that we had we had the most amazing and wonderful editor to work with, the young uh, Steve Wren. Uh, he's still youthful, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I said yes to all of this, and and the end result was this series, American Intellectual Culture, which you've already heard a little bit about from. Uh, Steve, um, it was absolutely the joy of my life for the, the year. It was it only six years? It seems longer than that. And we would have kept going. It was Roman Littlefield. They decided that it wasn't making enough money. It probably wasn't. But, uh, and they are a commercial publisher, so they have to make money. So, so they closed it down. All the books are still in print. I think all of them. Uh, and there were some, some uh, important books in that series. Uh, but uh, I do remember very well those Friday afternoon talks with Steve, sometimes with Ted, sometimes with Ted and Steve. And sometimes I would call Steve after talking to Ted and, <laughs> and say, I can't stand this guy. I can't work with him anymore. I, it, 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 that happened at least oh, seven or eight times. And Steve would always say, oh, Bill, calm down. And so, uh, so it never, never erupted. I don't think Ted actually was ever aware of how angry at him I got sometimes. So, uh, but it, it's partly because the qualities that everyone is just, and Peter Field just described in the passage it was just read, Ted was very direct, very blunt. And in email, sometimes this came across as brutal. Uh, in conversation, it never did. You know, uh, but but emails, and uh, I I did at one point say, you know, you need to control your language a little bit better, uh, because you said this, and it sort of sounds like go crawl in a hole. Are you, are you stupid or just lazy? <laughs> uh, uh, so he, but his bluntness and directness, it's something you come to appreciate after a while. That, that he is not holding back. There's no hidden agenda. He, he is incapable of dissembling or lying to you. And 
people like that uh, are rare, rare, rare things, rare gems. And so I came to cherish that honesty, even if I still have a few bruises here and there, or bruises in my ego from that. I think one of the things that drew Ted and me together, and this is really the, the substance of my talk, was we had a similar um, disease, unease with the historical profession. <clears throat> it's uh, one of the reasons why I like the company of Straussians uh, as, as much as I do, because I'm, I'm not as harsh as they are about history, but I, I share some of their misgivings. Um, but here's a more precise way of putting it. I, I, when I went to Johns Hopkins in graduate school, and Johns Hopkins, as already uh, Lee has already described, first self-consciously German-style research university, not at all interested in the task of cultural conservation. No, it was the breaking through to the new frontiers of knowledge, upsetting all the old paradigms, you know, through science, Wissenschaft, uh, uh, crawling out of every nook and cranny. Uh, and there's still a little bit of that spirit at Hopkins when I was a student. Um, and then I come across in my uh, first year seminar, uh, for reasons uh, not worth going into, we were reading a lot of George Santayana, who I've never read. And Santayana is an absolutely charming writer. I, I don't know how well he works as a philosopher, but, I, but he's a great phrase maker. And here's a quotation that I noted at the time in my first semester, and, and it's something that absolutely shocked me. He said, it is one of the foibles of romanticism to insist on rewriting history and perpetually publishing new views without new matter. Can we really know more about the past than its memorials transmit to us? <laughs> Evidently, we cannot know more. In point of truth concerning human history, any tradition is better than any reconstruction. Absolutely shocking words for a Johns Hopkins uh, seminar. Um, and, he said, and he goes on to say, tradition may be a ruin, broken unrecognizably, or shabbily built over in a jungle of accretions, yet it always retains some nucleus of antiquity, whereas a reconstruction is somehow fundamentally arbitrary and modern from top to bottom. Uh, Substitution is no mere mistake. It's a voluntary delusion which romantic egotism positively craves to rebuild the truth near the heart's desire. Well, as I say, this is a shocking statement to me, a repudiation of everything that Johns Hopkins University stood for, at least the, 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 the glorious task of historical revisionism, which must go on continuously, churning and churning. Uh, so this was just an idol of romanticism, a delusion? That, that, that's chutzpah. Uh, and and, and Santiano wasn't even Jewish. So. <laughs> and he made me think, any tradition is better than any reconstruction. A reconstruction is something modern from top to bottom. These two sayings seem to me to be true, to ha or to have an element of truth in them let's say, not to, to necessarily, I wouldn't want to live and die by them, but they, were, they seemed to have this element of truth, that the flames of memory kept alive, uh, it, it kept embodied in custom, passed along in tradition, even ruins and relics and rituals. These all have their reason for being, their own insight, their own right to our respect a right that can't be abrogated in the effort to make history into a science. We are human beings. That means we're subjects as well as objects. And as Santayana was right, memory also had its claims as the foundation of a word that Roger Scruton loved to use, Lebenswelt, our life world, the world as we experience it, uh, the world as it's given to us, not as science uh, explains it to us, the world we inherit. Um, maybe these claims are not absolute, maybe they were, uh, uh, you know, partial, but they seemed to me to, to be durable. I think this is absolutely a perception that Ted shared completely. And we he sort of recognized this, we recognized this disposition in one another, even if I could never have articulated it at the time. Um, 
So memory became uh, a big part of my understanding of of uh, what I valued in conservatism. I think it's something that, uh, and I think Ted implicitly did as well. I think you can see it in, in Coming Home. Let me talk about memory a little bit uh, because uh, it has many facets, but I think it's essential to the notion of a traditional society. Let's start, consider it from a practical, <clears throat> not particularly philosophical angle. Alzheimer's disease, it's perhaps the most dreaded disease of our time. It robs people of their memories. It takes them, and in taking away their memories, it takes bit by bit, takes away their identity, their sense of who and what they are. Many of us, too many of us, have had the unsettling experience of looking into the eyes of someone that we knew well. Uh, and not being entirely certain that the person we knew is still there uh, behind the eyes. Whether th this person still remembers who he is or whether he still participates in the relationship that we used to have. Without memory, he slips away. It slips away from our shared world into a darkness inaccessible. So the importance of memory, uh, we can see by what happens to us when we're, it's absent in the individual level. Now let me talk about, uh, this is a more delightful, although ultimately sad, way of thinking about it. Uh, it's a poem by uh, Dana Joya, the great California poet. Uh, he lives in Northern California, but we can forgive him that. Um, it's a poem I love. Uh, I think it's particularly appropriate uh, for this occasion. Uh, it's, ab it's about a subject that's almost entirely missing from popular culture, popular music. And the title will tell you what it is, Marriage of Many Years. And let me read the poem. It's a little bit intimate. I hope you won't mind. <clears throat> Most of what happens, happens beyond words. The lexicon of lip and fingertip defies translation into common speech. I recognize the musk of your dark hair. It always thrills me, though I can't describe it. My finger on your thigh does not touch skin. It touches your skin, warming to my touch. You are a language I have learned by heart. This intimate patois will vanish with us. It's only native speakers. Does it matter? Our tribal chants, our dances round the fire, perform the sorcery we most required. They bound us in a spell time could not break. Let the young vaunt their ecstasy. We keep our tribe of two in solitary and sovereign secrecy. What must be lost was never lost on us. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, you know, everybody's heard Tolstoy saying about how all happy families are the same. Well, he's, it's on so many things he was wrong. Uh, uh, every intimate patois, every tribal dance, every uh, expression along these lines is different. Each defies translation into something else. Each is a sort of hortus conclusus, an enclosed garden. Of, that cannot be translated to some other language. So what's described here is, again, the Lebensfeld. The Lebensfeld of a couple. Our tribe of two, as he says. Families, too, accumulate this kind of lore, patois, mental scrapbooks, of sayings and stories, adages, puns, snatches of TV shows and theme songs and song lyrics and advertising jingles and all of this forming the household patois, which is learned by heart, which is unique. You run into this when you marry somebody and you come into their household. We have a saying in our family and so on and so forth. Um, and the intimate patois vanishes with the native speakers. Sometimes it vanishes prematurely when one of the natives in a couple is gone through death or divorce or dementia. The loss is incalculable because the memory 
can't, you can't sustain a language of one. Once the possibility of conversation goes, the color and suppleness go with it, and soon it becomes no language at all. All right, can we discuss larger collectivities, larger uh, groups of people in similar terms? Yes, I think we can. What's true for individuals or couples or families is true in different ways for nations and peoples. What memory is for individuals, history is for civilizations. And without the reference points of a broadly shared historical consciousness, we soon forget who we are and we perish. A culture without memory will be barbarous and easily tyrannized. Daily events will occupy all of our attention and defeat our efforts to connect the past, present, and future and divert us from an understanding of the human things that unfold in time, including the path of our own lives. And yet there are crucial differences here. No one can be accused of contracting Alzheimer's disease by some action of neglect or commission even. Uh, it's an organic condition we don't understand. But the American people can be blamed if we abandon the requirement to know our own past, if we fail to pass on that knowledge to the rising generations. We will be responsible for our own decline, and our society has come dangerously close to this very state. Small wonder that so many young Americans now arrive at adulthood without any sense of membership in a society which is actually one of the greatest enterprises in human history. That this should be so is a tragedy and a crime, a squandering of a rightful inheritance. Now back to historiography and then the link with Ted. In our time, this problem takes the form of a paradox for us, those of us who have PhDs in histories especially. We know, we know more and more about the American past. All kinds of things about the American past arrived at by ingenious research methods, by specialized professional historians who are extraordinarily skilled and tenacious and principled in their professional activity. But we know less because we don't grasp anymore the overarching meaning of our history, the way that the product of these specialized forms of research come together and augment and support, buttress that meaning. The meaning that would impart coherence to the way we live together. We lack a perspective that would put the great achievements of American history in the proper light, properly weighed against failings and shortcomings and taking into account the contrast between the dispiriting brutality of most of human history and the astonishing prosperity and freedom and potential of our own. <clears throat> we lack a shared sense of the exceptional character of our pioneering experiment in self-rule, that term that so dear to Ted's heart, self-rule. A reminder not only of our great good fortune in the land, but also the great responsibilities that this good fortune entails. Something else that I think Ted and I, and we came to a more conscious realization of this uh, feature that we shared, is something in the nature of modern historiography, which stands in a completely different relationship to the past than does memory. And yet both are needed. Uh, just a couple of years ago, I came across a book that, uh, and many of the greatest insights that I've had have come from studying works in Jewish historiography. And this was an example of that. It's a book called Zakhor, uh, Z-A-K-H-O-R. Uh, and it's a study of the peculiar, peculiar and peculiarly powerful, intense tension between memory and history in Jewish life, Jewish intellectual life, and Jewish life more generally. The author is a guy named Yosef Yerushalmi, uh, and uh, 
he makes this point that the Zakor, the title, is, uh, this is uh, about as much Hebrew as I know, but Zakor is a biblical verb of admonition. Remember! Yeah. Um, that's that song by the Shirelles, you know, remember, <laughs> walking in the sand, remember. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, you don't remember that. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're just missing out. <laughs> that's a crime. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you need to be taught. Remember. But what is one to remember? You know, I mean, can we be a little more specific? Remember. Although himself a modern historian, Yerushalmi is, 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 is insistent on, and let me quote him here, historiography is just one expression of the awareness that history is meaningful and of the need to remember. And neither meaning nor memory ultimately depend upon it. Yet he also argues that with the advent of modern historiography, the coherence of the Jewish tradition has been broken. It's broken down. The very assumption upon which the entire tradition of meaning and memory, was the, the, the entire tradition of meaning and memory, quote, the, the belief that divine providence is not only an ultimate but an active causal factor in Jewish history, close quote, must be denied. Thus, modern Jewish historiography, he argues, has the ironic effect of disintegrating the very object of its interest. It is, he concludes, a peculiarly modern dilemma. I, in a way, I was reminded when Lee was talking about the theological, political problem. This is another instance of it, isn't it? Uh, a version of that problem. The Jewish belief and, and the historiography of Judaism <laughs> are, are uh, in opposition to one another. Again, uh, Santiana's statement is useful here. A reconstruction is something fundamentally arbitrary, created by personal fancy and modern from top to bottom. I wouldn't agree with all of that. <coughs> uh, but what he is saying is that a carefully curated, professionally certified reconstruction of public memory quite possibly bears the same relationship to a real and living tradition that Disneyland does to actual towns. There is no past and nothing worth remembering about it when reality is reconstructed in the image of the present. That was Santana's insight, I think. Far better is the older view that the past is another country that the only way the past can be allowed to broaden us and teach us things we don't already know. When the past is a prisoner of the present, the present because a prison becomes a prison for us all. Brad Wilson mentioned uh, Strauss's wonderful essay, Progress in Return, which I assign every chance I get, I, again, I can't quite get away with it in some classes, the modern progressive movement, I couldn't quite do that. But uh, it is, a, it's a wonderful uh, expression of, and actually what we try to do at Hillsdale in uh, the way that we approach the Western tradition. The Western tradition is something that is uh, made up of tensions. This is Strauss's argument, that the tension between biblical religion and, and the Jerusalem and Athens, you know, that, that he uh, uses that, that very handy uh, opposition, Jerusalem and Athens. Uh, two ways of looking at the world, two ways of approaching inquiry or ethical thought, grounded in two very different things, in the biblical revelation and in the activity of reason. Uh, Ted, uh, Ted believed in both of these things. And one thing I'll leave you with is that something that always puzzled me is this book on Walter Lippmann. First, first of all, I was, why is he so interested in Walter Lippmann? And uh, occasionally we'd talk about it, and he, he, when Ted was gripped by something, you knew he was on to something. Uh, and I think he saw Lippmann partly because he was a, in, in the early in his life, was a complete advocate of a sort of positivist approach to, 
to inquiry and uh, to uh, the, the notion in his book, Preface of Morals, he talks about the acids of modernity and that they're, they're unstoppable. They erode all the traditional beliefs, everything that's passed down from the past. And we just have to kind of start over with the use of a sort of uh, managerial, rational uh, uh, capacity that, that, that we have now come into when all faiths are dead. Um, and uh, Ted being uh, uh, so greatly respectful of the, of the analytic mind, never could quite dismiss that. He, he had uh, two mentors in his graduate school days and shortly after. One of them was Russell Kirk, and the other one was Paul Konkin. And Konkin, um, who, one of whose books we published in the series, called, it's called Requiem for the American Village. And Konkin was a, a guy from a very hard scrabble background and a kind of a very impressive figure, worked like a dog to get to, sort of to the top of his profession. And he was completely uh, of the view that the modern world uh, was, with Lippmann-esque reading of the modern world, he was uh, totally devoted to atheistic, analytic um, ap approach to historiography. Um, uh, and he was an intellectual historian, so that there was a certain rigor in his approach to things. But he was uh, about as opposite to Russell Kirk as you could get. Um, requiem for the American village. You could have a certain affection, but you don't have requiems for things that are still living or have any prospect of living. So Ted was in a very, I think, a way like Strauss's understanding of the Western tradition as this tension between opposites. I think Ted um, never resolved, maybe never wanted to resolve, or felt that he could honestly resolve the tension between the Paul Conk the side of himself and the, the uh, Kirkian side of himself. But I know where his heart was. It was much more with the Kirkian side. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Bill. I'm a little confused at this point in, in the conference. I've, I've, spelt, I've felt a little bit at a loss through the whole thing after uh, giving my talk at the beginning. And I've felt like I've, I've learned quite a bit here uh, about Ted personally and professionally and intellectually as well, some things that um, are actually sort of new to me. I had known Ted since uh, very early on. I reviewed his, his book, uh, Revolt Against Modernity, and we were at a number of ISI conferences together until I was disinvited from going to any more. Um, which shows, you know, Ted apparently was the better diplomat among the two of us. Uh, but the Ted that I knew from there and from Liberty Fund conferences, and occasionally I would meet him either at the Kirk Center or at a Philadelphia Society meeting or some such. Um, our relationship was always very cordial, but I, I never had an argument with the man. In fact, if anything, I found him somewhat, well, very quiet, very concerned, almost deferential. Um, just that kind of a man who wanted to talk about ideas and substances. So there was that over the years, and we exchanged uh, notes every once in a while. Um, but it wasn't a really uh, close relationship until he, I guess we should talk about at least a little bit, the, the book itself, until he contacted me about the project that he'd been working on, which became Coming Home, uh, which, by the way, it, it might be helpful to know that the uh, title was almost rejected. Uh, Ted was told, I, I'm not sure by whom, that it had racist overtones and that it would be better not to use it. And he took that criticism seriously. He was concerned because the idea was, you know, this is a mass market publisher. This was to be a public statement that mattered, and he didn't want to queer the deal, as it were, uh, right off the bat. But we stuck with it, and I think it um, brings together a lot of things if you look at his writings. And you know, I, I went over many of his essays to, to get ready for you know, writing my talk and so on. Mm -hmm. And it's a theme that's throughout all of his writings, um, the, the need for this. And the chapter that he did on, on place, it's, it's, it's about home. And it was very much what was uh, in there. And this book, which, which began as a statement, 
right, for, for, for Pepperdine, uh, a purpose statement, and he'd written a uh, first draft of sort of the first half, the, the history of conservatism and, and setting up the, the big ideas. And um, he asked me for uh, some help editing it at one point. And I usually, when people edit, uh, ask me to edit for them, I ask them how much they're willing to pay because I loathe editing other people's work, as my children find out, because I make sure it's, it's uh, as painful for them as possible. But that wasn't the case here. It was, I enjoyed it, and we ended up working together, and then he asked me to uh, help him with the second half, uh, which is policy proposals for the most part, going to, going to specifics after talking about the, the downfall of conservatism when it became simply right-wing liberalism, uh, how that came about and how damaging that was for the republic and what we might do uh, in looking at it. So perhaps, um, one of the things that's going on is that my TED may be only a part of your TED. The TED that came about post-Obama. And I'm beginning to really think that that's part of what's going on here. Because certainly at the ISI conferences, it was, all, it was very Kirkian. At those conferences, it was, it was about memory in such in a way that really fit in with this. And he talked about the Lippmann book now and again. But you know, I wasn't the one to talk about it all that much. I wasn't trained as a historian. And it was a different way. Um, but by the time we got to write uh, the two books that we ended up doing, we enjoyed this one so much that we, we did another one. Uh, but um, by then, if, if you may recall, if you look at the book, he says one of our problems is we no longer have a public philosophy. So I think by that time, he considered certain things to have been settled. And he wasn't going to accept them. So perhaps part of what happened later in life, when we fell off the cultural cliff, which he and I both agreed was really a product of the Obama administration when the administrative state was unleashed through the achievement of socialized medicine in its half-hearted form. Uh, you had, again, the, the last real checks on administrative power were, for the most part, taken off. Trump attempted but failed to bring them back on, and, and of course, now they rule the roost. But I think there was perhaps some change in there. You know, we didn't have a single disagreement in writing two books. And you could probably take that as a criticism of Ted from your point of view. <laughs> but, but trust me, uh, he was fully involved in this. Big chunks of it. And the first half of this is, is him. The second half is, is uh, uh, significantly him. Big chunks of the second book are him. Uh, but we worked together. And we, we edited each other's pieces. And, the man I found in that, he was a traditional conservative. He was Kirk, he was Tocqueville, and he was Edmund Burke. Not the Edmund Burke of Leo Strauss. I found the last panel, panel highly interesting. And you know, I'll, I'll, <laughs> this, is, this is about Ted. But I, I got to say, if you actually read Revolt Against Modernity, it's about the revolt against modernity. It's not about Leo Strauss. It's not even about Le uh, Eric Vogelin. They were two somewhat interesting figures who he respected, who had a critique of modernity and how liberalism had broken down. When I think of revolt against modernity, what I'm reminded of more than anything else, because as a Catholic, it hit me like a, a punch in the gut, was his retelling of the story of Job, about how Job was a, uh, a good man who suffered because God made an unjust arrangement with Satan, the deceiver in which he agreed to go ahead and test Job, took everything away from him. And Job tried his hardest to deal with this, and God just kept hitting him. And in the end, finally, he cried out, knowing that if he'd gone to a, a, a neutral arbiter, the neutral arbiter would have said, God, you're being unjust. And what did he get when he finally said, please, why are you doing this? What he got, this Ted's retelling, was an assertion of power. I am God, you are not. And then he ends it up by saying the proper uh, translation of God's name is I will be who I will be. Not I am who I am, but my will is what shall rule. <sighs> we could have had an argument about that one. <laughs> right? 
we Catholics, you know, God, he's not actually restricted, but by being all loving as well as all knowing, he will follow natural, you know, all the things that a Catholic would say to that. But God love him, <laughs> Church of Christ. You take the hit and you know what's going to come. You're not going to know what to do about it. You take the hit and you do your best with it. There's not going to always be a way of understanding it. And I guess we understood each other because he had no interest in engaging in theological debate. He, he said to me nice things and said, you know, I'm practically half a Catholic. I'm sure he's just putting me off. <laughs> but, but I understand the way I grew up, and this just isn't something we're going to have a talk about. That was what he brought to it, okay? An encapsulation of the tragic sense of life in a way that I'm not sh at all sure I could live with if I had it to that extent. Now, I've got a tragic sense of life, but nothing compared to that. And it clearly stood him in good stead, because he got hit, and hit again, and he kept his faith. But in terms of what this meant for Ted as a scholar, which again, I, I think it's important to keep that in mind, it, how important that is, as much as, you know, I love him like a brother. But my Ted, the Ted that I knew, was a traditional conservatism who was PO'd. He would say to people, I see you drank the Kool-Aid. Right? I would want to say that. I'm not sure I'd have the courage to say it on a campus. Because I think it did a lot of damage to a lot of people and it killed a fair number of people. But, but can, can I just, I mean, I, that was four years ago, within the last four years, that that would have happened. What, what, what uh, is a longer span involved here? And I mean, is there some point where you see Ted changing? Um, becoming more oriented towards uh, public events, towards politics uh, on a national level. When he started writing for Front Porch Republic, you saw this start coming out. What was that, about 10 years ago? Mm. At least, well, maybe more than that. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that's <coughs> Obama. <coughs> that's Obama. And it was things that he recognized. You know, I, I heard from his students when I was teaching his students. They talked about how he, he wore a hat. We the people are pissed off. I think part of that is that he saw that we had reached a point where, in fact, our civilization was crumbling. And, you know, I'd written a book about this, the, the death of constitutional morality. So we had certain things in common. But I think it's important, I, I understand what you're saying, and you're, you're probably a little less than happy about the way this is going. But he wasn't, he wasn't always angry. I mean, you knew him as well as I did. Yeah. It's not like he spent his whole time angry. But he saw that we'd reached a point. So what you saw come out of it were a couple of books that said, look, things have fallen apart. Conservatism as we know it has become utterly corrupt and must, in a sense, be replaced. Just as he said, our elite must be replaced. And what does that take? Not mere political activism, but civic engagement, uh, reordering of our priorities, an understanding that we have to take a role in our communities. And, you know, Lest we think that this was, in fact, some sort of populist radicalism, I, I don't think it was at all. Like, again, the, it was Tocqueville, it was Kirk, and most fundamentally, I think it was Burke, who he talked about a lot more than he wrote about. But the Burke of the Anglo-American tradition, not the Burke of Leo Strauss, who, um, because of the perfectly understandable experiences he, he had and his concerns about Nazism and um, the idealism of the German uh, philosophy, misinterpreted Burke as being a historicist in that reified sense in which you talk about reason, revelation. Sorry, I'm not stressing. <laughs> that different understanding of large thingified ideas. Burke was someone who said, look, there are certain aspects to human nature we've all got. They play themselves out in changing circumstances. That changes people's habits and the institutions. And I see that when he looked at history, I think that's what he saw. Mm. I mean, more than anything else, I saw history with Ted as his epistemology. It's a way of knowing. Yeah, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, a home and such, but it, it, it's a way of knowing. And to the extent that mm. I've done history, you know, uh, my T PhD is in, in political philosophy, so I'm, I'm aware of the great books thing, but I was always unhappy with the way it tends to be just the book. There's no context to it. Um, 
But then I worked with Harold Berman in, in law school who wrote a couple of books on law and revolution. In legal history, if it's actually done right, which isn't very common, uh, it's about trying to tell a story. What, we, uh, what gets dismissed as Whig history is pretty close to, I think, what is useful history, which is what have we got now and where did it come from? Something that you're interested in and you investigate it. The same as you know, etymology. We've, we've got a word now. Where did that come from? We've got a concept now. Where did that come from? So it, it's stories. And what makes them work and makes us allow in them is it doesn't have a meta narrative that it has to fit in. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a workman like uh, a job. And that one of the problems we've got now is there's so much meta history that all we deal with is narratives that are useful or not useful for somebody's meta history that we're all supposed to be on the right side of. Right? Don't, don't want to be on the wrong side of history. Pete, you're here. Yes. Yeah, we want to hear from you. <laughs> um, well, you would ask that I try to wrap this panel with connecting um, both coming home, but also uh, the things that we've discussed uh, both last night and today into this institution. Since Ted has passed, I think it's fair to say that I've developed an entirely new appreciation for the importance of institution building. And it's been said a few times here, and we have institution builders in this room, but again, as someone who was a very close friend of his, once a student, then a colleague, then supposedly his boss, um, I've come to understand in new ways just the power of institutions and how they really can carry on the life of someone. And so it's been said a few times just how Ted's influence on SPP is um, in one sense foundational, but I, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit here in some brief comments about um, where this is all going and why it's important. So one of the, um, one of the several things that Ted sent me in his last few years, especially as he had a sense that um, what he was suffering may be terminal, was a four and a half page essay giving the history of uh, roots and great books. And he sensed, or at least wanted to make sure, whatever happened, and he sent me this, I looked and it was in um, 2019, he wanted to make sure that I understood and future deans of this place understood why these important courses were created and what they were created for. And so in this memo, essentially, he goes through where things started, um, the relationship with Gordon, the connection to James Q. Wilson, who some of you know was very much a part of our, our founding here at SPP and then goes first into Roots of American Order and how that course started and how it's changed over the years, uh, but why it's important to be a part of a, uh, a core of a master in public policy uh, program. And then he went into Great Books, which is the, the second course that Ted had so much involvement in uh, not only teaching but developing. And so I just wanted to read this last paragraph of this uh, essay, and again, he's gone through roots first and then gone into great books. And then he said, um, writes here, finally, this memo and the specific concerns that I've raised about each class are related to what I expect is a shared vision and goal to make our core curriculum as integrated, rigorous, and foundational as possible. I want our graduates to look back at their core courses they look, they took and see retrospectively a clear logic to it that is connected to the work they do and the changes they seek to make. To this end, we need to talk about these two classes in ways that expose to ourselves and to our students the answer to this rich question. 
What does it do for me as part of a public policy education? How utilitarian, how professional. The better we are at asking that of ourselves and of answering it with greater acuity and confidence, the more those who teach these classes will fine tune them toward that end. And the more other faculty will engage these classes in, uh, in their own way. And so I end with my assertion that the four forms of analysis, economic, statistical, political, and moral, form the core of our education. Now, <clears throat> there's some, I graduated from, I'm in the unique position of graduating from a program that I'm now dean of. And in that, I've had this unique experience of not only going through these classes and understanding how they hit me, but also speaking to now hundreds of alumni who have graduated over the last almost 20 years since I graduated, 15 years. And there's something about the way that Ted built into those particular two core classes and some of the others that were related electives in the curriculum that students will come back, alumni will come back and say, I didn't know I needed to know this until. And then they'll tell the story of something they went through working at the city of Los Angeles or on Capitol Hill or working in some think tank. And it usually goes something like this. So Ted had this great phrase that he often used in describing the importance of having roots and great books in the core and the fact that he is an historian, a cultural historian at that, teaching in a public policy program. And if you're not familiar with this discipline, it's usually pretty boring. It's usually very technocratic. As Bruce said last night, a lot of these programs came into being following the Great Society. And the ones that came into being beforehand followed the New Deal. And so the purpose of many of these graduate policy programs was to prepare the federal bureaucrats to run the administrative states that were created in those two periods. It's why the Kennedy School is called the Kennedy School of Government. It's not the Kennedy School of Public Policy. So Ted had this phrase that he always said that he wanted to make sure that students develop the skill to be able to, quote, think historically. And I heard that phrase a lot when I was a student. I said, yeah, you know, you're a historian. I'm sure you want people to think historically. And you're taking great books, and you're reading the Federalists, and you're anti-Federalists, and you're reading the Federalist papers, and you're, doing, you're reading various aspects of history. And you know, you're learning these dates and times and things that you would in these kinds of courses. And it wasn't until I got out that I realized that he wasn't teaching me history. He was teaching me how to think historically. Now, what is thinking historically? Thinking historically is an approach to public leadership that is desperately needed today. So after I graduated, I made one of many stupid financial decisions and agreed to take a job in a nonprofit called Common Sense California that was started by one of my other faculty at Pepperdine, the former president of Pepperdine, David Davenport. And the mission of Common Sense California was to support and promote civic engagement at the local level in communities starting in California, but over time as that nonprofit has morphed into what is now our Davenport Institute for Public Engagement to train, educate, and consult on public engagement processes around the country, mostly all focused at the local level. So one of the first projects that I worked on was for the city of Salinas birthplace of John Steinbeck, up the coast here, outside of a much more beautiful town of Carmel. Farming community, 
And Salinas, this was 2010, Salinas had a very difficult problem coming out of the Great Recession. They had a $20 million deficit on a $100 million general fund. They knew they were going to have to make some very radical, drastic cuts to public services, probably propose some tax and fee increases to somehow get to a balanced budget, which cities and some states have to do. And so the city reached out to me, the mayor, who's still a friend of mine, he's not mayor any longer, but a guy named Dennis Donahue, and the city manager, still a friend of mine, no longer a city manager, a guy named Artie Fields, reached out and said, Pete, we hear that this Common Sense California is supporting and consulting on public processes to make very thorny public local decisions. We really need your help. We've got some, uh, a major budget challenge that frankly, if we were to just make it on our own, i.e. by staff and council, I don't think the public is ready for the significant changes that are gonna have to come about. And so I began making trips up to Salinas, learning about these issues, bringing in an outside consulting firm that leads public processes around these kinds of uh, budget issues, and sure enough, we scheduled a series of five workshops, public workshops around the city, all facilitated, all beginning with kind of, this is the Salinas Budget 101, and here are some of the trade-offs that we're looking to make, and our city could look like this, or this, or this, or this, and it was kind of a way of taking people that frankly, and I'm sure it's probably true of most people in, your, in this room, as smart as you are, you have no idea how your local budget works. You probably don't even know who your city council members are. Anyway, first meeting is in a community college auditorium. And we go through this whole three hour evening process. We had about 200 Salinans in the, in the room. People are learning about the budget and understanding, wow, I didn't think things were that bad. And well, okay, if I had to make this decision and here were my options, I would choose this and people talk. I mean, it was like a regular, it was a town hall thing that we were facilitating. And at the end of the meeting, the facilitator, Heidi, still a friend, says, okay, Really appreciate all the feedback. You guys have worked really hard on these issues. We've taken down all the things that you have uh, discussed. But at this point, I just wanted to ask some questions of you all to see what this experience was like. What was it, what was it like to go through a, a deliberative democratic process on your community's budget? And one person got up and said, you know, I really did appreciate this. I didn't know how bad things were in the city, um, but I've, I've appreciated the opportunity to both learn about our municipal budget and also give my feedback on the decisions I would make. I got to meet neighbors and people here in the community that I've never met before. But I have to say, and I'm standing next to the mayor in the back of the room, and she kind of turns back to the mayor, I have to say, I know this report is going to be joined with the other, the feedback from the other community meetings. I honestly don't care what the council decides about these budget issues. I just want a Salinas where my daughter, after she graduates high school, can come back to live. And I'm standing next to Dennis and I elbowed him in his rather rotund figure. I said, Dennis, did you hear that? He goes, yeah, the lady wants her daughter to come back home and live in Salinas. I said, Dennis, that's everything. Everything you discuss about the technical aspects of budgets and line items and all the Excel spreadsheets and all that stuff doesn't matter. You need to connect it to what she said. She not only loves Selena so much that she's living there, she loves it so much that she wants her daughter to live there and grow up and raise a family. And that 
experience combined with a number of others that I've had working on these public processes, including ones here in Malibu, and every training that I get to do with public officials about doing public engagement and community building, I talk about this aspect and importance of thinking historically. I'll close with a metaphor that I use. My last training, we have a contract agreement with the California Police Chiefs Association. And I train cops in how to build community, which you may have heard is not the easiest thing for cops to do these days. And the last session that I did was up in the lovely garden spot of Folsom, California, home to one of the great prisons in the country made famous by the late, great Johnny Cash. And there's a metaphor that I've developed called the policy box that really came out of that experience first here as a student, and especially this art of thinking historically and why it's so important for policymakers to understand. And I use it now in every training session for local government officials that understands that public policy is actually a pretty simple thing. I hate to say that as a dean of a program that, you know, takes two years to go through and, you know, a lot of different courses and things you need to know. But public policy is actually pretty simple. And in this policy box metaphor, if you can kind of put your mind in this place, I begin with a three-sided figure image in which the top part of the box is the policy goal. Imagine if you will. What's the policy goal? Increasing high school graduation rates, reducing prison recidivism, reducing traffic fatalities, uh, reducing nuclear arms, whatever it is, that's your policy goal. It's not more than that, it's not less than that. One of the other sides of the box is the regulatory environment could start with a local ordinance down here. You cannot build a pink house in Malibu. You can in other places, but you can't in Malibu. That's a local ordinance. And that goes all the way up to the US Constitution. And that governs how you can approach that policy goal. The other side of the box is the budget, right? For whatever you're looking to do, increasing graduation rates or reducing traffic fatalities, you don't have a trillion dollars to do it as much as some in the federal government believe we do. You really have a limited a number of funds to approach that. Inside that box is the solution somewhere. And we all know this intuitively, right? We all know that Malibu is different than Hillsdale, Michigan. That the things that concern the people of Malibu, I learned this firsthand, I was asked to moderate the mayoral debate of Malibu. And let me tell you, the things they care about here in Malibu, you would not believe. They have pink houses in Hillsdale? Well, yeah. let's hope so. A few. But I mean, at one point we were debating the pesticides that were being used on the medians, that somehow these were not ecologically friendly pesticides. I mean, I'm guessing that Hillsdale is not debating these issues. But somewhere in the middle of that figure is that solution. But the bottom part of the box is the entire game. The bottom part of the box really does determine, if you can imagine it, and this is the metaphor, if you can imagine it kind of as a slider can slide up or down, can either give you a lot of different options within that box or just a very thin layer of possible options. And that bottom part of the box is history and culture. It's what? History and culture. And I've seen it so many times. And I see it now, unfortunately, in our country. And it's been remarked several times here over these panels. It's one thing not to know our history, that's bad. 
It's an entirely other thing not to be able to think historically. To tell the city manager who just started in Santa Monica, the first thing you really should do is read the history of how Santa Monica came to be first. Because the people you're going to be engaging with in your council meetings, in public comment, in the rumors that are around, could go back decades. And this is true of every community in the country, in the world. This is the human aspect of who we are. As yes, political creatures, yes, social beings, but we are also historical beings. Michael Hewling is here, one of Ted's last students, now works in Clark County. I was just speaking with him. He works for the, in, in the county office. And in seven minutes of speaking to Michael over lunch, he's saying, you know, it's a crazy thing about Vegas. <laughs> Vegas has got these different aspects of history that you go back to. It used to be just kind of a a stop-off point for people coming from the Midwest to California, and then you've got, of course, the mob era that goes through. That is thinking historically. And unless we're able to connect, this is how we connect the techna of public policy, and it's there. It really is there. And you really need to know how to do multiple regressions. I'm sorry. We're not a, we're not a program in political theory. You really need to be able to do the statistical analysis of policy. You have to. But if you can't connect that to the particular history and culture of where you're working, you won't understand the public part of public policy. And as Ted would often say, this is not an exact science, people. It's the reason that a policy will work in Malibu and won't even work in Santa Monica, much less Baghdad, Iraq. And so from this point on, and the next dean here will certainly get this document, this is why it's not only the fact that Ted had this influence on this program and on people like me and Michael and Alan and others, but we desperately need it now for a political culture that doesn't even not know its own history, but isn't capable of thinking historically. That's where public leaders need to be, not just saying why policy A is better than policy B, but understand how this change fits with this particular community. Well, it's respecting the past as something real and not just as a sort of story uh, that's in, in a book somewhere, but it's actually embodied in the community, in the ways that people associate, in the way that the, the, the streets are laid out, in the way that uh, you know, certain kind of customary usages have evolved. And of course, one of Ted's points is that you know, really the it's a mistake to think of America as a sort of proposition nation, as if a sort of idea uh, becomes the focal point from which everything else emanates. No, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a process that comes about through people making their way in the world, settling where they can settle, you know, making use of the resources that are there, you know, yeah. making, making a, a, a sort of piecemeal existence. Uh, but that it becomes customary, that it becomes traditionary. I would, just, I would just add to that, though, history isn't necessarily looking back. Thinking historically is about how we make progress rightly understood. That is what Ted taught, that if we're going to manage the conflict inherent in public policy, we are going to have to do it by thinking historically. Can I read one line? At Dina's request. One of the great opportunities that comes from historical truth-telling is to understand our heritage in a way that engenders gratitude, a real and profound sense of humility at the limits of any generation of people, and the kind of humble knowledge that spurs the great work of civilization, preserving,
pruning and improving. Amen. Great. Well, that brings us to a close. Thank you all. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone.